Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome again to Syriana Analysis. I'm your host, Kirk Almasian. Thank you very much for tuning in to today's live streaming, guys. I hope you are doing well, and I see that you're very excited to be and to listen to Pepe Escobar today. You are tuning on this live streaming from the United States, from Europe, and even from Japan. One of our uh, streamers and uh, viewers says, watching from Japan at midnight, Pepe Escobar, it's always, I'm very happy to see you face again on Syrian analysis. Uh, I mean, in Arabic, we say you are Rani Ana Tarif. You are too famous to be introduced. And <laughs> your, 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 <laughs> your name pops up every day in my live chat when I do live streaming, when Pepe coming, is coming to uh, Syrian analysis again. And he is a very uh, busy uh, analyst and author. And he recently also published a new book, Eurasia versus NATO stan and if i may if i may uh, read uh, the description of the book because of i was course. checking it today and in, in eurasia versus nato stan pepper escobar takes us on a whirlwind journey through the swirling sands of the 21st centuries defining clash from the ancient silk roads to the modern day war of economic corridors escobar paints a vivid picture of a world in transition where the old order is crumbling and the new multipolar reality is struggling to be born. With his non parallel blend of historical insight, deep cultural appreciation, and sharp geopolitical analysis, Escobar exposes the West's quote-unquote rules-based international order. For the sham it is, a mere smokescreen for the empire of chaos to perpetrate its forever wars and plunder the global south. But the tide is turning, Led by the Russia-China strategic partnership, a new global majority is rising, forging new alliances and building alternative systems that bypass West's rigged game. Pepe, when I uh, read this description, the first thing that I notice is that you say the old order is crumbling. And mm -hmm. I totally agree that we can see it in front of our eyes. It's like slow but you can even uh, see it with your own eyes, the challenges that the United States is facing on a geopolitical sphere, the institutions that were under the control of the United States. And we can see that there is a new multipolar world that is rising, but this multipolar world is struggling, according mm -hmm. to you as well, to be born, mm -hmm. right? What mm -hmm. are the main challenges, if we want to start this discussion with you, the main military and economic challenges faced by the proponents of the multipolarity and how effective is the U.S. resistance to the emergence of the world order? We have the proponents and we have the resistance to the emergence of the multipolar world. So if we may start, how, how, what are the challenges first? In fact, the resistance, Kevork, is by the different axis of resistance across the multipolar world. Because this is a resistance against a system that is imploding very, very fast. And of course, uh, they, they simply won't leave quietly deep into the night. Hmm. They can even cause a global conflagration because they you know, resign themselves to the fact that they are not a predominant power anymore. And that's where we are, especially this year. Uh, I see this year as the decisive year for the next few years, for the next decade, and for the rest of the the century, for that matter, mm -hmm. for many reasons. Uh, what will be the, I wouldn't say the ending, but the continuation of these two major wars that we're facing at the moment. We know that one of them has, I would say, a tentative end game in mm. Ukraine, which is the cosmic humiliation of NATO, as I call yes. it. But the other one is way more complex because it involves the, let's call them the biblical psychopaths on one side, uh, wagging the dog or the dog wagging the tail. We don't know who wags who in the whole <laughs> thing uh, with the hegemon. So the the very, very close relationship between uh, Washington and Tel Aviv. And on the other side, what I would say the most important axis of resistance of them all, which is the West Asia axis of resistance. And then we find Iran, Syria, Hezbollah, Ansarallah in Yemen, the militias in Iraq, among others, right? So this will 
I would say, frame the next few months and years. Uh, what's going to happen with these two? I would say mirror wars, in fact, because these are essentially imperial wars. Mm. Even if in West Asia it is conducted by this uh, unspeakable regime in Tel Aviv, but it's a war that it's uh, condoned, uh, supported, weaponized by the hegemon. So the hegemon is deeply implicated in this war. In uh, the black soil of Novorossiya, how I like to call them, uh, and uh, I, I think I, I, I said this before, but I always like to repeat it because it's, uh, it's one of those intuitions that you have in the middle of the night. And in my case, it happened when I was deep in the Donbass countryside and I couldn't sleep, of course. Too much information to digest. And then he, yeah, you know, it, it rained out like a, 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 a Zeus lightning bolt. Yes. Well, this uh, black, rich black soil of Novorossiya, mm. uh, land of miners, a land of uh, uh, very, very rich soil, of course, that has propelled uh, this part of Russian land uh, to become a, not only a working class, but a middle, a solid middle class society all over. It's where the rules based um, international order is coming to die. And of course, this may seem uh, too radical for many of you watching <laughs> us, but when you go to Novorossiya, when you go to Donbass, when you see what's going on, when you talk to military commanders, when you talk to the local people living in Donetsk or, or even in Avdiivka, which I had a chance to do last month, in fact, then you see, wow, you don't mess with these people. They are so strong. They have such a profound grasp of their history, of their moral values, of their religious values, of their patriotic values, of their linguistic values, and the fact that they played always uh, a very important part in everything that happened in Russia for the past few centuries. And starting with the past century, uh, the Great Patriotic War, uh, the, I would say, sorry tragedy in Afghanistan where we had a lot of fighters for the USSR in Afghanistan. And of course, since 2014, the fight against uh, the regime in Kiev. Yes. So, so, so uh, the, the, inter, the, the, the local interaction, especially in Donetsk, I became with, with two visits this year. One in uh, March and uh, one one in February, another one in March. I I'm becoming more and more uh, like Donetsk is part of me now, which is something that it was not before. I had been there only once after uh, the the Bald Civil Cauldron in 2015, mm. but now it's different. Now now you are you make local friends. Uh, you have military commanders that trust you. Yes. That you know that tell you stories that uh, it's very hard for them to tell foreigners. For instance, yes. they understand the point of view of a foreigner that is deeply interested to learn from them, to listen to them, to learn from them. Which is which is our attitude when you when we go to Donbass. So that changes everything. It becomes personal. Like uh, whoever had, I would say, uh, the honor and the temerity to have lived in Syria during the war, in Libya during the war, or in Gaza hmm. for these past few decades. You know, it, it, it becomes personal for us. That's my case now. For me now, Donbass is personal because of these personal interactions. Hmm. And, and nowadays we are reaching a point where uh, even those who have not been there, and then I, I'm talking about the so-called uh, self-appointed elites in, the, in uh, NATO stand. The NATO mm -hmm. universe. For instance, uh, Prime, uh, Foreign Minister David of Arabia Cameron mm -hmm. and French Foreign Minister Stéphane Sejourné, who never had any sort of international uh, relations experience in his life. And now he's the <laughs> Foreign Minister of France because his lover, his former lover, who is now the Prime Minister of France, appointed him. 
Berbock is also. She never had an experience in never, diplomacy. Is that, Ber, Berbock is even worse. Is that. So and uh, and then and then they said only a few days ago, and I'm sure uh, many of you in the audience remember, if uh, Ukraine loses, we all lose, which was probably the only rational thing they have said in this past few weeks or months. Mm -hmm. That you know they're starting to get the picture that Ukraine will inevitably lose, and when they say we all lose, means NATO loses. Yes, and obviously you won't see uh, that slab of Norwegian wood ever admitting it in uh, in person. Yes. But when you, when you look at his body language, basically this is what he's saying with his body language. We yeah. all know we lost, we don't have a plan B, and we don't know what's going to happen next. So that's where we are at the moment. So, so that makes it even more dangerous because yes. then the people who actually provoked everything for the past 10 years, including our hegemonic partners that yeah. have spent $300 billion in 10 years, which is probably the worst return on investment in modern history. Yes. To get uh, what our friend Andrei Martinov calls a country 404, yeah, which is some will be right. Yeah, so that makes it even more dangerous. So, so Kevork, we're not we, we're not even talking about the danger in West Asia. So, ju just gives you an idea of how bad the situation could become if the warmongers decide to up the ante in Ukraine, which they will probably do, right? You know, which uh, I disagree with you, and that they don't have Plan B. You know what's their Plan B? Their Tell Plan me. B is the, is the same Plan A, and it's repeating the same Plan A over and over again, and expecting uh, different results. <laughs> yeah, in, in fact, you're right, Kevork, because uh, there was never a Plan B, as we all remember. Plan <laughs> A was we provoked them uh, into a war. We destroyed their economy in two weeks yes. or months maximum. Uh, our armies. Our NATO armies and uh, NATO trained armies will destroy them in a few months. And then we go there and plunder everything like we did in the 90s. This was plan yes. A, and it never changed, right? Yes. You know, uh, Pepe, uh, when I follow the situation in Eastern Europe, I come across uh, something that concerns me. And this is one of the challenges, I believe, in the rise of multipolarity. Um, is the inability of China and Russia to sell their project to the masses. For example, mm -hmm. the people in Syria know what, what it means to live under rules-based order. People mm -hmm. in Libya know, Iraqis know, the people in Donbass know, in, in, in Russia know, in China know. But for example, when you go to Georgia, when you yeah. go to Armenia, which I'm ethnic Armenian, and you see that... Uh, you have a younger generation is impressed uh, by the EU, impressed by becoming westernized because westernized. yes, because it's easier to sell the EU uh, project and the EU narrative. There is not much a language barrier, for example. English has become an universal language in this regard. You have uh, the Americans are selling the their cultural view, democracy, human rights, movies, NGOs, exchange programs. The English language is not a barrier. And in, I speak with uh, Ukrainians, mostly mm -hmm. from the anti-Russian side, uh, Armenians nowadays, uh, Georgians, Polish people, um, and you see that uh, it's difficult for the Russians and the Chinese to sell and, and market their vision in these places because the people uh, are radically becoming against, uh, for example, the Russian, uh, the Russian side. And mm -hmm. in Armenia, you see nowadays that they are turning themselves into another pawn against uh, Russia. By, be mm -hmm. by n becoming an, a NATO vassal state, right? So unless these people become a victim of NATO, just like the, the uh, Serbs became victim, the Libyans became victims, and the Ameri and the Syrians became victims, probably some people will not really understand what it means to live under American rules-based order to mm -hmm. be subjugated and then being used and instrumented uh, like instrumentalizing them against the enemy, which is here, Russia, right? And I believe the next war is going to be in the Caucasus. And this time the Armenians are going to be victims of this victims. war because 
they will be sandwiched between Azerbaijan and Turkey. And the Iranians are not going to tolerate a NATO country on the borders. Uh, 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 and the Russians aren't going to tolerate that. And uh, this is going to be a, a new opportunity for, as you mentioned, the empire of chaos to spread mm-hmm. its it's it's chaos now in the Southern Caucasus. So the people aren't really learning from the lessons of the near lessons and the historical lessons. So it's really difficult, in my opinion, for the Russians and the Chinese to sell their projects for these few peoples unless they become victims of the American hegemony. That's an excellent point, Kevork. We in fact we could write a book about that. Um, first of all, uh, war of narratives. Who controls? the language that shapes the narrative controls the narrative. This is what the Americans, they are better than anybody to do that. And with the support, of course, of pop culture. In fact, they sell any narrative through pop culture. They can sell this narrative with the Netflix uh, series, with the Hollywood blockbusters, with uh, rappers, you name it. It's very, very, with the um, refurbished Westerns, you name it. It's very, very easy. And the fact that uh, English is not uh, so much a language anymore. English is an operating system. Mm-hmm. So, and of course, because they invented the operating system, all the upgrades, they make the upgrades as well. Mm-hmm. And everybody else has to adapt. Yes. So that, that brings us to the first problem, which is the lost in translation problem. If we have Putin, Lavrov, Maria Zakharova, who are absolutely first-class communicators, not to mention Xi Jinping, uh, uh, Hua Xuning in China, uh, the, 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 uh, the officials at the Ministry of Foreign Relations in China were getting better and better. Yes. They may say something absolutely extraordinary, and usually they do, and practically on a daily basis, but the lost in translation problem. Once again, this is something that I discussed face-to-face, very closely, with Iranians. And, uh, of course, Iranians are, rightly so, very proud of the Farsi language, which is absolutely outstanding, language is extremely sophisticated. But I was trying to argue with them, look, you need to fine-tune your message not only to West Asia, but to the rest of the global South cells, yeah, as well. And obviously, and you have to turn the operating system upside down to your benefit. Yes. So don't be afraid to use English to communicate your message. The same applies to Russia and the same apl- applies to China. Of course, it's extremely difficult because uh, it's inbuilt in these three major civilizations, Persia, Russia and China, uh, the weight of their amazing past, their accomplishments, of course, uh, their history, and obviously inbuilt in all that is the power of their language. Yes. So they would they would have to let's put it this way: betray their language so they can reach uh, you know a, a, a much vaster audience all, all across the world. Oh, yes, in fact, that's the case. But you have to be pragmatic. Mm-hmm. And nowadays, uh, the soft power win is basically in the, in the PR field. It's basically yes. in social media, in social networks, and the fact that people will be talking about what you said. Yes, They cannot talk about what you said if you say it in Mandarin. Unfortunately, unfortunately yeah. it's only in the Chinese sphere. Okay, it's big enough because that includes the Chinese diaspora. So then it's not only 1.3 billion people in China. It's another, at least another 150 million all over the world. You know, Uh, Russia is the same thing. That's the Russian diaspora, much smaller. And Persia, even uh, Iran, even smaller than that. But you have to use the the weapons of the enemy against the against the Uh enemy. And this extrapolates to geoeconomics. Which goes back to the beginning of your first uh, observation in our conversation. You have to turn geoeconomics upside down uh, to the profit of the BRICS, to the profit of the global majority, which is something that Sergei Lavrov himself now, he refers to the rest of the world, which is the majority, as the global majority. It's absolutely correct, conceptually correct. 
all of us, we are the global majority. Uh, the problem is we don't control the system. We don't establish the rules and we don't uh, tweak the rules-based order like the hegemon does and the international financial system. Yes. Because the people who are the main articulators and the main nodes of the international financial system, they are hegemonic nodes and they're vassals, satrapies everywhere around. Them. So, you know, it's a, it's a geopolitical, geoeconomic and cultural challenge at the same time. It's, that's what makes it so hard to uh, this drive towards multipolarity. It's much, much harder than any of us suspect or expect yes. pepe if i may only ask you a technical yes. thing can you can you bring your uh microphone to the middle of your shirt because it's hitting your shirt from this side uh, uh, the, the the right side the right's on the, the this right. is the right where the uh, microphone is just bring it here like in the no middle. there's no oh. microphone i think maybe it's my buddha okay <laughs> <laughs> my my buddha is interfering in our conversation uh, uh, believe that <laughs> the buddha is saying look well, everything look that you said uh, man, uh, exactly. <laughs> you have to pay attention to the power of buddhism of taoism yes, yes. of confucianism <laughs> <laughs> Pepe, you know, as you mentioned, this uh, language uh, barrier thing, it's very important because when the war started in Syria, yeah. uh, the uh, the, per the former permanent envoy of Syria to the UN, uh, he changed this tradition of speaking only in Arabic and he only started in speaking Arabic. in English. And then he started speaking in English because this was Excellent. an existential war. Yeah. It was an existential war. So he wanted to deliver the message in English yeah. so that the public can understand him. And I would just quote him. He he quoted uh, Najib Mahfouz. He's an Egyptian, uh, late Egyptian writer. And He's he told... Uh, you know what he told? brilliant. Ah. Yes. He quoted Najib Mahfouz. Um, yeah when he wanted to criticize the Western officials when the Western officials were trying to intervene in Syria. And he said, um, they are liars and they know they are liars and they mm -hmm. know that we know that they are liars. Even exactly. so, they keep lying very loudly. So this this exactly. was uh, a quote from Najib Mahfouz and I found it really uh, beautiful back then. Uh, Pepe, the collective West. Now, I, if I want to play the devil's advocate, right? Please, uh, the, go ahead. The, the, the collective West and the rules-based order stands yeah, naked in front of the general public, especially after the Gaza onslaught. But you argue in your book that the tide is turning against the empire of chaos and it's forever worse to plunder the global south. But the other side, uh, in the NATO side, or those who dislike Russia and China, they say, why would someone... Uh, who stands, for example, in the middle, pick Russia and China, uh, where uh, when Russia is occupying Ukraine, and and uh, China is trying to bring Taiwan back to the mainland. So they also they also have imperialistic tendencies, right? And also they are going, for example, to places like in Africa and investing there and pushing them into depths. And uh, they 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 point out to these powers as also imperialist powers, and we we see how this term has been normalized again after the Ukraine war, referring to Russia as an imperialist power and also China as an imperialist power. Bullshit, total bullshit. Uh, this proves, first of all, uh, many things. These people don't travel. Not only they don't travel to Russia and to China and to different regions of Russia and China and to uh, very, very specific places in the post-Soviet uh, sphere. Or in case of China, they don't even go to Xinjiang, for that matter, to see what, what real life is in Xinjiang, for that matter. Not to mention they don't travel in Africa and they don't talk to Africans. And they don't talk to Africans who to try to uh, explain to foreigners the positive role of China investing in, in I would say, between 70 and 80 percent of African nations. So, uh, well, I get this kind of uh, bullshit on my inbox every day. To uh, in uh, it, It's a tsunami every day that it, it, uh, I wake up in the morning and say, oh, no, not again. It's And it's all there. Uh, the headlines are all. There. I only he read the he the headlines nowadays. You know, it's all there, and it's the same uh, Russian aggression, uh, Chinese um, genocide in Xinjiang, 
uh, the death trap, not only in Africa, but in every single uh, project related to the New Silk Roads, the Belt and Road Initiative. It's, it's always the same thing. Uh, there are two possibilities. One, we waste most of our working lives trying to counteract this stupidity. And second, we ignore them. Mm. I, I'm part of the uh, let's ignore them bunch now. I, I have no time for that anymore. <laughs> First of all, because we have to work and we have to explain to our readers and our audiences uh, everywhere what's really happening in Russia, in China, in Africa, the interactions of the Global South, which are very complex, uh, the nodes of the Global South that the hegemon is trying to exploit, divide and rule style to prevent you know, a smooth drive towards multipolarity. And this is becoming more and more complex. As you mentioned, one of these key nodes is the Caucasus. Yes. Which is, there's no question about it, would be number one ca candidate for another hardcore hybrid war, color revolution, all of the above. The other one is Central Asia, and especially the most vulnerable uh, stands, which uh, would be Tajikistan and Tajikistan. Kyrgyzstan. Taj yeah. more, uh, more Tajikistan than Kyrgyzstan. Is Kyrgyzstan, because Kyrgyzstan is still infested with Atlanticists. Every time that I go there, I, I never cease to be amazed by it. And Tajikistan, which uh, my last time in Tajikistan was before COVID. Uh, I would like to come back as soon as possible, especially after Krokus. And uh, uh, Tajikistan is much more complicated, but the interconnection of ISIS and ISIS-K with Tajikistan is much more advanced than in the other stands. It's not by accident that uh, the people who were recruited for Krokus, they were Tajiks, because there are uh, uh, ISIS and ISIS-K connections online, Tajiks and Tajiks uh, preachers, let's put it this way, who are who have an enormous influence online in Tajikistan, and it's very easy to recruit unemployed Tajiks who remain in Tajikistan instead of trying to find a job in Moscow, for instance. Yeah. It's very funny because every time every time that I take a taxi in Moscow, which is every day, the driver is either Kyrgyz or Tajik, Tajik. and we usually start a mini conversation. Ah, Duchambe, <laughs> Osh, and all that, and they love it, of course. And they all say the same thing. It says, yeah, we came here because there are no jobs over there. Mm -hmm. wow. So so th this is, okay, so this is the second focus. And the third uh, focus could be Pakistan. And the fact that Pakistan, in, uh, the hegemon, will never allow Iran and Pakistan to have closer relations. Even now that they are, especially now that they are both members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So that's why we're starting to hear and we're starting to see almost on a monthly basis something happening in Baluchistan because yeah. that's where the CIA has been since forever. And that's where it's very easy to pit uh, Sunni uh, extremists on one side uh, linked to ISIS to Shiite extremists on the other side. Yes. So, so these are only three of the focuses that uh, the Ajamon will be working on. Not to mention all across Africa, South America, for instance, now that they are going to get uh, U.S. naval base in southern Argentina. So mm. in, in terms of the hegemon, this is uh, better than Christmas in July. Really. <laughs> they get their uh, asset elected. They get their asset to practically break relations with Brazil and refuse to enter BRICS. Uh, the asset antagonizes China. The asset antagonizes Russia. And on top of it, he, you know, the, the, the commander of the South Com, Laura, Laura, <laughs> not Laura, the, 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 the Laura of that famous Hollywood movie with Gene Tierney. Laura Richardson goes to Ushuaia in southern Argentina, and Millet catches a plane to kiss her feet and said, okay, you're going to open your uh, naval military <laughs> base here anytime, darling. So, you know, so, and, and we have Ecuador as well. So, you know, it's very easy for the hegemon to destabilize South America, which would be a lesson for the Armenians. 
Yes. You see mm -hmm. what happens when you are embraced by the hegemon, willingly yes. or not willingly. Okay, here, here's what's happened since the 60s. You know, do a little bit of homework of Latin, especially South America, as uh, the backyard of the hegemon. So this would teach the, the Armenians a few things about, you know, uh, the West is the next big thing. No, it's not. And uh, I seriously, uh, I, I'm really, really sorry. I, I also have, a, uh, let's say, an emotional connection with Armenia via Armenians that I met since I was a kid, in fact. And the fact that they could have a wonderful past integrated in the Eurasia Economic Union, having good relations with Russia. There's an Armenian diaspora in Russia, working in Russia, a pro progressive businessman, you know, very well. And, and now they're choosing what basically Ukraine did in 2014. Yeah, also antagonizing Iran. Iran and is the friendliest. Iran. Exactly. This is the friendliest, the friendliest the country friendliest, for uh, for for, <laughs> for the vis -vis, vis -vis Armenia. You're right, yeah. exactly. Well, but this was uh, what Pashinian uh, was supposed to be doing from the beginning, right, Kavork? So now he's delivering. Actually, this is yeah. why he came to power in 2018 after the exactly. after the color revolution and. Yes. Uh, People now ask me why am I not speaking much about Armenia because it's very depressing uh, to speak yeah. about Armenia in this climate when in 2018 I warned against this color revolution. Well, you get accused of being a conspiracy theorist and then I said in 2020 when the war started in Karapar that uh, he will lose this war and then if he loses this war he will lose the buffer zone between Armenia and Azerbaijan and then Azerbaijan will start moving inside Armenia. Inside and I was Armenia. called... Yeah, yeah, and I was called a paranoid, but now I don't see there is any barrier left for Azerbaijan to occupy Armenia. And um, the national spirit is broken. Any, nas any person who believes in Armenian national identity is being equated to fascists mm -hmm. and fascism. You know, this... Uh, very cliche accusations. Mm. And uh, the government in Armenia has a strong grip over the state institutions now. Uh, Pashinyan kicked out all the competent generals, officers, and he appointed his uh, people in the army, in the security. So in my opinion, Armenia is heading toward the very, very dark times. And this is why it's depressing for me, because as mm. much as you speak, it's not going to change anything by, by talking. The mm. opposition has to do something about it and they are very weak to do anything about it. So I see that they, when the other day, uh, the editor-in-chief of RT, Simonian, when she's Armenian, and she's when Armenian. She's, yeah. she said uh, in five years, there may not be Armenia on the map. And she received lots of backlash uh, about that. And I think sometimes she say things, but it, she's probably correct. Uh, people need to understand the severity and the, uh, the, the severity of the issue. If mm -hmm. Azerbaijan or Turkey attack Armenia, Armenians don't have a chance <laughs> against this, exactly. uh, this power. Exactly. So, so they need a deterrent power. Who is the deterrent power? Do they think that the United States will come and fight for them? No. Do they think the French would come and fight for them? Vo no. So uh, the alternative, which was the, um, the, the Russians that have a, a base there, they will be kicked out soon mm. uh, mm -hmm. by Armenia. Mm -hmm. So basically, you are just shooting yourself in the leg yes, <laughs> in, this, <exactly>. in this case. <laughs> which, is, which is a classic in the, uh, in the Global South, isn't it, Kavor? Yeah. It, it's, it's, the, it's, it's the story of the Global South since uh, the, the, the first wave of decolonization, in fact. Yeah, yeah. Everywhere. Pepe, uh, I received a question from yes. uh, an audience says, Pepe, in the middle of May, all of NATO-Stan Defender 2024 maneuver will be all around Russia's borders. You think they will still be tempted now after Wang Yi said China will not sit idle and watch? Um, I haven't seen this statement from the Foreign Ministry of China. And um, what do you think about it? Uh, this uh, Are they going to do a military maneuver uh, in the surroundings of Russia? No, they're testing the waters. Mm. Uh, first, first of all, because, uh, okay, uh, well, we can always assume that there are some uh, NATO generals with a brain. Mm. Not many, but there, are, but there are. Just like the Pentagon, there are. And some retired ones 
who have seen, who have lived the Cold War and remember the Cold War, these people uh, have much more common sense. Yeah? Mm. Uh, they know how NATO is demilitarized. Uh, the national armies that compose NATO are a joke, apart maybe from Turkey, maybe. Uh, the other ones are an absolute joke. And, and this, this is a matter of a discussion now, even here in, in Paris. Uh, and, uh, and Ukraine, of course, would be the most important NATO army of them all. It's decimated. Yeah. Uh, so even if they have, what, 100,000 NATO soldiers on the borders of Russia, what are they going to do? <laughs> well, Russia has, Russia can come up with another 500,000, which are in the, in the rear, in a flash, if they want to. And it's not about number of soldiers, about weapons. And who's yes. got the weapons? And who's got the weapons that make a difference? It's Russia. Yes. In, ev in ev all across the spectrum. And every good military analyst knows that. Uh, obviously not those people in, in the beltway, of course. So they're testing the waters. And, and obviously they are selling this to uh, European public opinion as, ah, NATO is worried about our safety. Uh, we are trying to prevent uh, further instances of Russian aggression. That's why we have these exercises, etc. So basically, this is another PR move, right? But uh, of course, it's dangerous because when it comes to uh, who runs NATO, this is not the number one uh, in the list of priorities, this is not priority number one. Priority number one is already shifting towards China. Yes. And everybody knows that, not only in the Beltway, but depending on the next administration in Washington. And, and the fact that the neocons who organize the whole thing in Russia are not directly related to the push against China, but then we have another set of uh, neocons, but it still is the same thing. Plus, of course, a great deal of the establishment, because the case of China is much more complicated. Russia, it's not that Russia is going to become the next uh, economic superpower tomorrow. China is already, already the economic superpower in the world by PPP and the number one trading partner of virtually the whole planet. This is already yes. a fact. Yes. And that for, and then we're talking about the American establishment. You mean the, the, ru the real ruling class in the US, the guys who we can say run the show. And that's what terrifies them, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so that's much more complicated. So we should be paying much more attention to the South China Sea, in fact, as the Chinese are doing it. Yep. All right, but the great thing is, whatever happens in these two different uh, nodes of the chessboard, the Russia-China strategic partnership—they are gaming all scenarios. And, and the the meeting this week between Lavrov and Wang Yi in Beijing, and then with Lavrov and Xi Jinping in person, fantastic. You know, so th this is an. In uh, Xi Jinping receives Lavrov and talks to him face to face. He doesn't yes. do that with other foreign ministers. It's yes. only Lavrov and nobody else. You know, you never do this, for instance, with uh, uh, Jai Jankar from India. Never. Mm -hmm. But with Lavrov is another story. And the fact that they are coordinating everything. For instance, between yesterday and today, we received the confirmation on the record of something that in my latest column I just put it in diplomatic commas, that the Russians and the Iranians are talking all the time about the Iranian response to the attack yes. against the consulate. In it, It's obvious, obviously, of course. You, you won't have a direct tacit admission on, on both sides. In fact, the fact that Ryabkov said this on the record today is already extremely important. He said, we are discussing all possible ramifications with our Iranian colleagues, which is, a, a, I would say, an indirect message to the Israelis and the Americans as well. Yes. Look, whatever you do, you won't be attacking Iran. You'll be attacking mm. us. Yes. As the attack in, 
against uh, Iran in Damascus was an attack against BRICS as well. I, I made the point of th this is very clear. This is an uh, in terms of uh, an attack on a diplomatic mission protected by the Vienna Convention, this was an attack on everyone that is a member of BRICS and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization at the same time. Uh, considering that this is an out of control biblical psychotic religion, how they, foolish and, how foolish is this and how foolish is that but they could attack any embassy or consulate of any british yes. member tomorrow if they see fit for their crazy agenda uh, it is it's it's beyond foolish uh there's only one rational explanation for that it's because they want an escalation and they yeah. want to drag the americans into their escalation and of course, there are still some people with a brain in DC that are saying, no, we don't need a hot war in West Asia in an electoral year. They, uh, some of them got the picture. Hmm. The problem is the Frankenstein in West Asia is totally out of control, especially yes. now that they, for all practical purposes, on a military level and on the point of view of decimating Hamas, they already lost. And it's obvious to anyone that they lost. So they need to change the subject. And changing the subject, of course, they up the ante. That's what they always do. And it was not an attack against Hezbollah. It was a direct attack against Iran. So yes. this is up, upping the ante up there. You know, they, they never did this before. This proves how absolutely desperate they are at the moment. And that's, what, uh, that, that's what's dangerous for all of us. Because we run the... And now, of course... Uh, a few days ago, uh, of course, this this was never admitted directly, but there was a rumor that the Americans were discussing with the Iranians indirectly via Switzerland and via Oman, exchanging guarantees. Look, if you want to respond to what happened in, in Damascus, it's okay, as long as you don't hit our bases mm -hmm. and our assets. No, that's not true. Today, mm. we have a different narrative saying that uh, the U.S. is fully behind whatever Israel does, which I mean, is what it was from the beginning. We, everybody knows that this is what they do. So if Israel decides to counterattack a possible Iranian response, the Americans will be behind it as well. Yes. And that's I mean, what were... makes it so dangerous because now it, it, re it really... Uh, what everybody was fearing this past few months, this thing cannot extrapolate towards a regional war. Now we are in front of it, right? Pepe, you, you mentioned the United States is uh, also behind this attack. I just want to screen this article uh, yes. because you're 100% correct. And this is not uh, from uh, an Iranian report or this is from the from Times the, of Israel. Of Israel. Exactly. Israel coordinates and gets approval from U.S. on uh, uh, some Syria some airstrike. Syria. Uh, some, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, mean, I they, love the they, yeah. they do. They, they do coordinate with the, uh, this was from 2022. They do coordinate right. because the Americans have forces there and sometimes the Americans even um, activate their jamming technology in alternative border crossing to blind the Syrian blind uh, radars. The Syri exactly. They, they, they're cooperating together. This is not only an Israeli attack. This is also an American participation in an attack on a sovereign um, uh, embassy, uh, on an embassy of a sovereign nation, on a sovereign, in the third country of a sovereign nation. This You're is... Right. Beyond imagination, what 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 they have done. I I just want to mention a few things because you said this is an attack on BRICS, and just be, two days before the Russian offensive on uh, Ukraine, the Russian defense minister was in Syria. Yes. And if I want to interpret it from my point of view, I don't know what happened there, but I would argue and say that speculate that the Russian defense minister said you have to hold your grounds now in Syria. You're at the forefront of this. You hold your grounds there. And now the foreign minister of uh, Iran, mm. Abdullahian, was in Damascus. Yeah. And he, from Damascus, he said that they're going to punish uh, Israel. So this is, go this is, this is like in, a group of nations are coordinating their actions and reactions. And this is unprecedented. People need yeah. to see the bigger picture here, how these countries are cooperating between each other against uh, one enemy, and that is the United States. And here, Israel is part 
in my opinion, it's just a, a part of this bigger game and it's part of the empire. So you see that Israel is acting like um, when, when the dinosaurs were demising and mm-hmm. at the end of the day, they're just with fire trying to kill everyone and <laughs> before before they ex- extinct. And I, I only mean the political entity of Israel. I believe that Hamas attack was, the timing was not uh, a coincidence. Like when Russia was achieving victories in Ukraine and the Americans are no more able to finance the war in the way they used to finance it in in, in the first year, and they see that the Americans are printing money to sustain this war, now a second war in the Middle East will drain the United States completely. And they dragged Israel into very, very costly war here mm-hmm. and now the americans have to see which war they have to invest uh, in it's it, either right. in ukraine or in the middle east right mm-hmm. and they chose now the middle east and they're losing big time that's a strategic war in ukraine mm-hmm. and they're going mm-hmm. to lose mm-hmm. now what what hamas and hezbollah have done in this war uh, also iran and syria and the yemenis they actually destroyed uh, the pillars of Israel. What was yes. wh- what are the pillars of Israel? One of which is it's a safe haven for the Jewish people around the world. It's no the, more a safe haven. The aura for the of people. invincibility as well. Exactly. So Israel lost its deterrence, and that's why they are bombing the hell out of Gaza. But this will not restore deterrence. And the enemies of Israel have become so emboldened, uh, especially on the front of Hezbollah, on the Houthi, uh, for example, front, that the Israelis do not have the military capability to strike a decisive victory against them. I mean, what is stopping Israel from going to war into Lebanon? In the past, they were cruising in Lebanon. In the morning, they wake up and they want to go to Lebanon. In the afternoon, they are already uh, past half of Lebanon in the 80s, in the 90s. What is stopping them now from going into war against Lebanon? They know it's going to be much worse than 2006. It's going to be worse They know they're going to be devastated. And this is something that I I saw for myself, Kevork, when I visited that border, the southern Lebanon border, all the way to the tri-border, where you are on the hills, and you are you are in southern Lebanon. You have occupied Palestine on the other side of the fence, and you have the the Syrian mountains on your left. Yes. So when I was there, I, I I you look at the geography and you talk to the local people in the local villages in southern Lebanon. You understand everything. Uh, so it's it's uh, I would say it's a sort of mirror image of Donbas. You yes. know, you you don't mess with these people. Not to mention that they are armed to the hilt. They will defend every inch of the territory. Uh, there is a, a network of defenses all over. The Israelis don't stand a chance if they try. Uh, and, and it's great to see it in front of you, because yeah. then you have the you have the feel of the land as well, and the feeling in the air as well. So uh, they know that this. Uh, <laughs> which is ridiculous. They are always saying, ah, we're going to expel uh, Hezbollah 50 kilometers <laughs> north all the way to the Litani River. It's a joke. Not even... <laughs> no, this is stupid. Everybody knows it's stupid. But <laughs> Hezbollah even... pushed them away 50 yeah, kilometers exactly, from the borders. Exactly. <laughs> is that, exactly. So, uh, but Iran is a completely different story because Iran, uh, we get into the realm of... Uh, an absolutely crazy obsession. Then, then it, it's a psychopathological phenomenon. In fact, that you know, real men go, remember real men go to Tehran at the time of Rumsfeld and Cheney, yeah. right? Yeah, which was almost a twenty. It's crazy, almost twenty years ago. They were talking about this in two thousand and five, two thousand and six, almost twenty years ago. But this is the mindset of the neocons and the Ziocons. Real men go to Tehran, and that's. The way they interpret it, this is their opening now. Okay, we attack their consulate, they're going to respond, and then we attack their nuclear installations, which, by the way, they're all buried and they don't even know where they are. And the Americans are going to help us. This is the way they think. Today, there was an article uh, in the New York Times, I believe, that they say that Iran has enriched uranium into extent that they can now develop three nuclear weapons. I don't know how uh, accurate Yeah, I read that. It's also bullshit because this is uh, speculative. Mm. Everything that they say is speculative. 
Yeah. Uh, they don't have inside Intel. They don't have inside Intel. Mm. Uh, for instance, in Tehran, in that uh, nuclear uh, plant in Isfahan, for instance, they don't have it. They don't know. Mm. But <laughs> yes, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I, I, I know, but uh, uh, it, it's very hard to strike uh, an auspicious uh, a tone in the middle of. We, we're talking about doom and gloom, <laughs> serial yeah. doom and gloom, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I can I can listen to you forever, um, and this is. Uh, uh, but I have to ask you the last question. I, yes, I, I of want, course. I want to know. I want to know if you agree with this notion because okay. Iran will respond definitely. It, it, there yes. is no way that they will respond. And, but and it, the Iran... complicated thing is that it has to be so. It's such a complex decision, Kevor. Hmm. It, it has to be carefully calculated, strong decisive uh rational at the same time and of course they cannot lose face if it's not strong enough and they yes. ca they cannot go overboard because then yes. all bets are off so you can imagine how difficult it is and now especially because they put uh, their hands on the table because ayatollah khamenei himself mm. already said there will be a response inside israel you think the response it's a very good question. I, I would say that they would calculate to do it outside of Israel mm, mm. to minimize the response. Mm. So this, this would be symmetrical if yeah. it's outside of Israel. If it's inside of Israel, then we have hardcore hot war yes. right away. I mean, the Iranians are already, if you see it from uh, objective lens, they are achieving slow but very effective uh, yeah, yes. uh, achievements in the region. And yes. if you see it from the 20 to 30 years from now, uh, Iran is going to overcome the influence of the Americans and the Israelis in the region by playing a very, uh, let's say, patient chase, uh, uh, chess with the, with, the, with the enemies. They don't need to go to war and no, rush into of war. Not. Nasrallah no. said that we, we could win over the enemy probably without even uh, fighting against them in a direct war. And this is the what they call the strategic patience. So yes. I fully agree with you that they don't want to go into direct war against Israel and give them the... Um, Again, the justification to retaliate and then another retaliation and the Americans come. But let's see. I mean, it's going to be in this probably in these two weeks. And uh, I don't think it will be um, very far away from now. And yes. it's going to be very interesting to see that why Abdullahian also came to uh, Damascus to coordinate. Is it going to be on the Golan Heights? Probably because Golan Heights is considered Syrian Golan territory. Heights, it, it, it's Syrian territory. Very, very mm -hmm. important. That mm -hmm. that would be, I would say, if we have a list of a, mm -hmm. a, a top three of uh, best return for investment, mm -hmm. I would put number one, Golan Heights. Yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> I'm happy that we agree on this. Of course, no, especially because the resonance around West Asia would be yeah. enormous, and for public opinion, yes, everywhere in, in West Asia and uh, in the middle of the axis of resistance as well will be um, massive. Massive. Yes, but all that, uh, um, uh, Kevork, very important, General Soleiman. Yeah, he thought it all out. Mm -hmm. it, it, mm -hmm. I'll never see <laughs> to be impressed. And you know, this is something that they told me in southern Lebanon the last time I was there that his uh, that Nasrallah looked at Soleimani like this, you know, mm -hmm. he had immense respect to Soleimani as a strategist and a long-term strategist. And it's not by accident that uh, the, gen the IRGC general that was killed in Damascus, he was implementing Soleimani, I said. He was a sort of Soleimani 2.0. Yes, it's actually, not, that's, that's not very true. An, ac an, an accident as well. So you, you can see how dangerous for Israel this guy was. Yes. Uh, okay, it doesn't matter if you kill him, and it doesn't matter if you killed Soleimani, because the process that was designed by Soleimani yeah. keeps going on. Yes, exactly that's as you described it. It's a, uh, slowly boiling. Uh, the, my friends from the cradle in Beirut, they brilliantly mm -hmm. described it. Slowly boiling the frog. Slowly boiling. Sharmin <laughs> <laughs> and the rest, they are doing amazing yes, job on the exactly. cradle.
Yeah. Guys, it, it goes without saying that the book, the new book of Pepe Escobar, you can order them, order it now online. I put the links in the description below, Thank Eurasia you. versus Neto Stan. You can purchase it from the United States and you can purchase it from uh, also from Germany. And uh, we say in uh, Arabic, you can hit three birds with one stone if you buy this book. Oh, how? <laughs> one, first, you, you buy the book of Pepe. Secondly, you delve into history and geopolitics and you understand the past and the present and you can also foresee the future. And the third, you can also, uh, by purchasing these books, you support this channel because those are affiliate links. You're not going to pay anything extra, but I get a commission from Amazon when you buy them. So everybody is, is a win-win. It's a win-win situation for everyone. This is an independent YouTube channel. Uh, 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 Uncle Putin is not paying me. Uncle Chichi Ping is not paying me. Uncle Assad is not paying me. Nobody is uh, writing checks to me. So uh, this is self-funded work, guys. I would really appreciate it. Um, uh, that and also, um, I'm glad to hear that Kevork. So, mm-hmm. so please, everybody, guys, buy it mm-hmm. through Kevork's yeah, channel. Yeah, yeah. And, it's, and, it's... and in terms of payment, it's very crazy. Look, I am. I'm. My publisher is American. Yeah. So you Great. know, it's not that I'm being paid by Putin for my book. Yeah. It's an yeah. American publisher. <laughs> I mean, uh, nowadays it's a very uh, the, the, uh, it's very difficult to convince people that you are independent because yes. um, the other side uh, it's paid by uh, the the deep state in the United States and it's uh, long hands everywhere. So they think that everyone is getting paid like them, you know. And uh, no, it, it, I've been accused by the German mainstream press that I'm the right hand of Assad, and they ask me who is paying paying me to make these videos. I said, look, I have my camera, I record, I edit, I publish, I do everything alone. I do the job exactly. of three, four journalists. I, I, I just learned these skills by time. So they get, oh my God, how is it possible? Nobody is uh, working, you know, with you. And they no, I'm just alone. So that's the beauty of independent, uh, that's staying why independent. why we scare them, uh, Kevork. Yeah, it is scary, in my opinion. That's why For also they suppress. Scary. Exactly, because we have initiative. Uh, you know, we have our networks. We learn how to do things. Uh, yeah. uh, we try to explain in detail for our audiences everywhere what's going on. It's mm-hmm. like the opposite of what they do. Exactly. Uh, yeah. It's very important to stick with your values and defend uh, defend it and also try to uh, do a type of work that can encourage peace. And this is the reason why I created this channel because they, sorry, fucked my country. Half the country was destroyed and I wanted yes. to tell the, the people the truth about what's happening and then in Ukraine, in Taiwan, in uh, Afghanistan, around the world. Pepe, this was an amazing chat with you. I really appreciate you, you dedicated this time. We had My hundreds pleasure. of people watching us uh, live today, and uh, we will keep in touch. If you come to Berlin, please hit me up. Okay, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to escape to NATO stand, maybe next week. <laughs> Hopefully. Thank Guys, you so we'll be, much. Uh, Thank you, Pepe. I will come uh, to you guys tomorrow again on a new live streaming at 5 p.m. Central European time, 11 a.m. Eastern American time. Peace be upon you, upon your families. Salam.